don't see Bob actually in the office of the light. I think uh, he's on his way. He was downstairs. He's on his way. He's oh, okay. grabbing okay. a step out of his office. I'll be okay. Right. Right. Got your email about this new center. Congratulations. Uh, it's an old center. It's yeah, old it's center. Not but a new director. It's, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's more like a, a chore. A chore, okay. Yeah. Hey, Bob. Wasn't that option for you? Uh, I mean, I was asked. Better? Okay. Okay, let's try this again. So, do you want to introduce the speaker oh, before we start? Or yeah? uh, okay. Well, actually, let me just say a few words. Uh, okay. So, Albert has actually been working in my group for a number of years now. Yeah. Uh, he's been working for so I think we also have Guan online. So he has actually been working on uh, fluid cytography and then the offshoot of fluid cytography uh, you know, over the past couple of years. Uh, so so yeah, he, I think he's, he's very ready to uh, And he combed his hair today. <laughs> okay, not every day? <laughs> not every day. <laughs> today he looks like a Korean pop star. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks. Re ready for the big job? <laughs> uh, Let's okay. Okay. Guan, do you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm going to dim the lights. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my defense. Uh, it's a bigger turnout than I expected. Uh, so the title of my thesis defense is uh, Computational Imaging, A Quest for the Perfect Image. Oh, and my name is Albert Chung. <laughs> Uh, so there are imaging systems permeate our lives. So for example, a camera helps us capture memories. Uh, we are even born with a pair of imaging systems to the eye. And in science, a uh, microscope helps you look at ever smaller things. And also imaging systems help you gauge depth and also map the world around us. And all of these imaging systems invariably have uh, focusing elements to focus a beam of light into a point. There are several ways to focus the beam, uh, but in our case, we use primarily focus on the convex, convex lens. So to begin my talk, I'd like to start with a basic understanding of the lens and the optical system uh, to give you uh, basic concepts of what an imaging system consists of. And then I'll go into uh, Fourier tychographic microscopy, which is a computational imaging method developed by Guan Zheng in 2013 in our group. And uh, that forms the basis of the rest of my work that I've done in this uh, PhD program. So then I will move on to the, in the detail of what I've done, uh, off, you know, offshooting off of uh, FPM. So I focused on average conversation methods uh, using FPM. The first is a high resolution wide field imaging of uneven sample. And then I'll talk about average and corrected bright field and fluorescence imaging. And lastly, I will discuss how I was able to do average and correction in a general optical system. So lens uh, uh, consists of, of, for example, uh, glass or plastic uh, elements that have higher refractive index than the surrounding media. And it focuses light by refraction, according to Snell's law. And uh, in imaging system, we make the following approximation, which is called paraxial approximation where the incidence angle is small enough so, such that you have a linear relationship from the input angle to the output angle. Which means that if you have a beam of light that is uh, you know, normal to the lens, it will focus at a point that is on the optical axis. But if you have a tilted beam, you will have a focused beam that is uh, laterally shifted, right? But when you have an uh, incident beam with a with big aperture, the paraxial approximation breaks down, and then you get aberration in your imaging system. So it no longer focuses to a point, but you get these blurry spots. And also when you have a uh, tilted beam, it no longer focuses to a point that's laterally shifted, but you get some smearing artifact. So this is the cause of the aberration. So there has been many efforts to correct for this optical aberration by adding more lens elements. So for example, in your camera, you actually have like tens of elements to correct for the aberration. And in the middle, you have a microscope objective lens which you see you, the number of elements to correct for the aberration increases with the increasing uh, numerical aperture. And uh, even your cell phone lens, uh, it consists of six elements, which is why you have this bump in your camera nowadays. You just cannot go any further down. 
So now let's just quantify the limits of this aberration. So here's the mathematical model. Uh, a typical uh, microscope system is a 4F system, uh, which consists of two lenses. One is objective lens, and the other is tube lens. And they're separated by their focal lengths. So at tube lens, focal length, and focal length of the objective lens. In the middle, there is an aperture. And below the objective lens, you have your sample plane. And above your tube lens, you have your image plane. So 4F system is a linear system, which means that what you get in your image uh, plane is a convolution of your point spread function of your system with the sample plane. You can express this in Fourier domain. Uh, so here, the, sam the image spectrum is equal to the transfer function times the sample's Fourier spectrum. And the transfer function is closely related to the aperture plane. So it's literally shaped like the aperture. So in the one dimensional case, it's called a coherent transfer function, where you just have a rect function, uh, the shape determined by the aperture. In the two dimensional case, you have what's called, usually called pupil function. So it's shaped like the aperture, circular aperture in your aperture plane. The resolution of a microscope is given by what's called a numerical aperture. And it's defined as the index of refraction of the media between the sample and the lens times the sine of the acceptance angle. Okay, so in the CTF and the pupil function picture, the extent of uh, basically how much of this beam you can collect, so the frequency spectrum extent is governed by the numerical aperture of your imaging system. And the bigger aperture you have, the tighter focus you can achieve. You can basically Fourier transform this into the spatial domain to get the point spread function you want. So you can see from this picture okay. that the aperture plane and the sample plane have this Fourier uh, transform relationship, which is very useful in my uh, further uh, discussion of uh, imaging system. So now we have some knowledge, some uh, preamble about what imaging system, how to describe your system. So then now we can quantify what's the, the, what are the limits of an imaging system. So first is a limited space bandwidth product. So space bandwidth product basically means uh, what are the total number of resolvable spots in your given field of view of an imaging system. So for a low NA uh, objective lens, you have a, you know, not a, as tight a focus spot as possible, but you, do afford, you can afford a big uh, field of view. But in case of a high numerical aperture, you can achieve tighter focus, but at the expense of increasing aberration. So higher NA uh, objective lenses actually have, has a lot of um, optical elements to correct for the aberration, but you cannot correct to the extent that you keep the same field of view. Your field of view actually decreases so that the number of resolvable spots in the end actually remains pretty much constant. And second uh, limitation is spatially varying aberration. So as I mentioned in this picture, you have a tilted beam and no longer focuses to a point. And you can imagine that for beam of different angles, you'll have different kind of aberration that's in, that's in play. So this is a ray diagram, but in the wavefront diagram, you can think about it as a spherical wavefront that emerges from a, a, a point source. It maps to a plane wave after a lens in case of aberration-free system. So in, the ca in this case, a pupil function is simply uh, amplitude one function. But in the case of aberration, you have a tilted wavefront, but with uh, some phase modulation. And you can describe that as a phase term overlaid on top of the pupil function. And uh, not only is the spatially varying aberration caused by the lens's limitation, but also if you have a sample that is not flat, you can imagine that in different locations you will have in-focus and out-of-focus images of the sample. So what was very uh, powerful about computational imaging, so in this case FPM, is that it can address all these limitations using numerical uh, modeling. So by combining just simple lens with the high computational power, we can correct for these aberrations <coughs> and limitations. So this uh, segues into uh, Fourier tachographic microscopy. Is there any questions so far? Okay, good. Um, so this is a typical setup of an FPM. So here you have the typical uh, 4F setup that you can observe in uh, a lot of microscopes <coughs> these days. 
uh, but the illumination is provided by an LED matrix in this case. So you can imagine that lighting up one LED uh, and assuming the LED is sufficiently placed far away, it, provi it provides planar illumination by the time it reaches the center. And what's uh, interesting about uh, this system is that when under this coherent illumination, because of this Fourier transform relationship between the sample plane and uh, the aperture plane, you are able to shift the Fourier spectrum of the sample so that every time you capture an image under different angle illumination, the aperture will sample different regions of the Fourier spectrum. And that information will get relayed to the detector. So for example, if you have a sample that consists of a resolution target, um, here originally you can resolve all these features, but because the imaging system has a finite uh, aperture in the Fourier domain, you are only able to uh, sample low, low pass version of this sample, basically. So by tilting the illumination, you're acquiring different spatial frequency region of the original sample. Here, so after we capture these low pass images, unfortunately we cannot just simply inverse Fourier transform it to just stitch them back into the Fourier domain because detectors uh, naturally lose the phase information of the incident field. So you just cannot directly reconstruct original S due to the loss of phase in the detected image. So this is where the FPM algorithm um, comes in. Uh, so the Ger FPM uses the gershberg saxton phase retrieval algorithm, which is basically an iterative algorithm to recover both the amplitude and phase of a complex field from just intensity-only measurement, given that you have some spatial, some uh, area overlap in your, uh, in your uh, sampled uh, spatial spectrum. So from uh, a paper by Jay Sun, uh, at least 30% overlap in your uh, acquisition uh, pupil ensures you to retrieve the lost phase uh, in this process. So as an example, so here on the left top, you'll Excuse see- me, in, this, in this paper, was this something he empirically observed? Or uh, yeah, in the paper, it was empirically observed. But after the paper was uh, you know, released online, a lot of people um, dove in and kind of verified what are the limits of uh, the phase retrieval algorithm. And this paper by uh, Sun was able to show that 30% overlap would be like the minimum um, that you can kind of retrieve the phase. And I think in that paper, they were able to demonstrate it experimentally. It wasn't like a theoretical um, Proving. So the theory says that the, the limit on how much overlap should be is 30%? So, the, so this phase retrieval, this iterative phase retrieval process um, doesn't have like a, a close, <coughs> like full, like um, water, water type proof that says, oh, this is the amount of percentage that you need. So this is highly uh, sample dependent because you can see that for simple images like this, um, you can probably get away with 30%. But if it's much more complex sample, which is very dense in its Fourier spectrum, it may not converge as well, uh, just with 30%. Are you, are you aware of any uh, sort of? No, I'm not, so that's, okay. why, so that's why I asked, you know, yeah. because this is, you know, so this is, of course, algorithmic dependent. Right? Yeah. So they're right. using this criteria, and this is a hard algorithm to, to analyze. So that's what I was wondering, when you said 30%, whether yeah. it was what they empirically observed. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, it'll depend on the sample, too, mm -hmm. to a large extent. Yeah. So here, um, these are the series of low-pass images captured by the detector. And this is the estimate of the high resolution, the original sample spatial frequency spectrum. And on the left bottom, is simply an inverse Fourier transform of this. So that gives you a guess of you know, what's the original sample. And you'll see that as we update the, the regions, we fill up the regions of the spatial frequency uh, spectrum with the phase retrieval algorithm, you'll see increase in resolution. So initially, you were only able to observe about group seven element one, but here you already see that you start to observe group seven element um, six, and even up to uh, group nine. And at the end of the algorithm, uh, so when you say that, right, it, it might mean something with someone who's very familiar with US Air Force target, but maybe you should say in microns. Oh, I see. 
Uh, this is a, know? I think, simulation. Well, you can think about it as a simulation. It's not a simulation. Okay. This is experimental. Research. Right, 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 right. So, um, so from each, from different group, uh, the resolution basically you double it. So from seven to eight, you double the you you are actually resolving features that are half the size. So from seven to nine, you are you are able to resolve things that are quarter the the, the size, um, and which uh, kind of makes sense in this picture too because now your numerical aperture is a combination of illumination NA and the objective NA. And here, the NA, the illumination NA was such that it was about uh, four times uh, the extent of the initial NA. So it does correspond. So here, we address the limited spatial bandwidth product by just tilting the illumination angle. And the second limitation of a conventional lens was spatially varying aberration. So it was, it's interesting that you can interweave uh, a simple line into the phase retrieval algorithm to recover the spatially varying aberration in your imaging system. So here um, is a work done by Al Xiaozhe, a previous grad student. He imaged a blood smear sample and uh, resolved a clear blood smear images across the field of view. And you notice that the pupil function is different for different regions because of the spatially varying aberration. Add something extra to the image as a Yeah, so he added a gradient-based uh, algorithm. So um, to not only update the sample spectrum, but also use that information to update the pupil function as well. Yeah. You, you didn't mess with the sample, that's what you're asking. Yeah. So it's a still the same sample. Yeah. So then I'm not following, so how does he correct for the aberration? So the in the uh, update process, so here is a set, uh, sample spatial spectrum, right? So you update the sample spectrum. But in each step, he also uses that information to update what the pupil function would look like. So it's the joint optimizer. So in there is an update step where you update this spectrum. You also up update the, sam uh, the pupil function. Oh, I see. So the, yeah. the usual algorithm updates the phase, I guess, you're saying. It, I mean, Gershberg Saxon, you go uh -huh. back and forth between, I'm trying to remember, the phase and the. Right. And so, Gershberg Saxton, so there are two to. components. First is you kind of estimate what the complex field would look like, okay. and then you replace the amplitude with the measured amplitude, uh, measured uh, intensity, right? And then you inverse Fourier transform that. And then, so that uh, inverse Fourier transform is a multiplication of a pupil function that sampled it and the latent sample spectrum. So in the original paper, we assume the pupil is just a bandpass filter. So everything is purely sampled. So we just fit that back into this space. But in this uh, simultaneous uh, pupil function recovery algorithm, we do take into account that this is multiplication of a pupil and a sample. So we jointly optimize these, both of them, both of them yeah. Okay, so so my the rest of my work uh, in my PhD uh, basically stems from uh, FPM. So I will dive uh, more deeply into the first part. Uh, high resolution wide field imaging of uneven sample. So this is kind of like a direct application of what FPM can provide you. Um, so in this work, uh, it was a collaboration with University of Miami and uh, they were able to fabricate this microfilter with the eight micron holes um, that is able to capture circulating tumor cells from a patient's blood sample uh, because these cells are bigger than what's uh, the other things in, in the blood. Um, and they would uh, look at this filter with the uh, cells uh, under an optical microscope to count the number of cells. But what was very painstaking was that this filter was about six millimeter by six millimeters, but they needed to observe these cells at a resolution, uh, at a high resolution, which only had a field of view of about a millimeter. So in order to scan this entire slide, they had to you know, sit there and mechanically scan this entire region to count all these cells. And not only that, uh, because <coughs> this, this filter was not perfectly flat, it was kind of crumpled, um, and also the cells were not on the same plane. 
even within the field, same field of view, you'll see some cells in focus, but some other cells are not in focus. So the microscopists, not only do they have to scan laterally, but they have to scan in Z as well to get sharp images, to get the correct counts. So this is a perfect fit for FPM, which can both get a wide field of view and high resolution image, and also correct for the spatially varying aberration. So here, um, this is the field of view afforded by a low NA objective, but we get the resolution of a high NA objective, like a 20x objective. So this is a conventional 20x image, and this is a uh, FPM image. They show a comparable resolution, and the parts where you know, they had different focus, they were able to be corrected by FPM. So <coughs> the microscopist no longer has to do the mechanical scanning to count these cells. So, so just, I'm sorry, yeah. so you, the, the top figures, the conventional, uh -huh. um, so I mean, just superficially looking at it, they look kind of similar. Are you, are you uh, claiming you're doing better than conventional? Are you competing with conventional with the simpler optical scheme? What is it that you're Right, so conventional at? optical image. Here you see two regions. And the number one region, the cells are sharply in focus. Mm -hmm. But in number two, it's blurry, right? Because um, the, set, the this filter is not perfectly flat. So within one field of view even, you have some regions that's out of focus and some regions that's in focus. So what a typical microscopist would have to do is they would just have to scan it in Z, translate the stage up and down to make sure they get a sharp image of that and that. So what's are you claiming that your image below the blurry one on the top is not sharp? Is that what you're claiming? The image below is the FPM reconstructed image. I so so yeah. the, the, the rightmost image. Yes, so this compared to that. This is a sharper image than this one. Yeah. So I think you actually have better better images that you've taken more recently. And maybe you should actually want to be replacing them as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering, I mean, if the purpose is to count how many cells there are, it seems mm -hmm. to me there's four maybe, and then there's four also below. Or right, I mean, or... yeah, you can count, count these cells kind of by looking at it. But also these microscopists, they don't just count cells. They also look at the morphology of it. So if it's blurry, it's hard to see like what the cells look like. <laughs> yeah. It's also uh, the breeze stuck on the uh, on the data, on the thing too, so we need to be able to exclude those. I see. What's debris in those? <coughs> yeah, there are other debris as well. So. But so is the improvement here again? I don't know. I'm not. Uh, is it market? So if there's somebody who wants to tell the difference between debris and the, the true cell, or your your method is a clear improvement. Uh, is a clear improvement in that um, the entire field of view will be sharply in focus. So the microscopists don't have to guess if it's a blurry image or if it's like a blurry debris. Yeah. Yeah. So in the top row is a single shot? This is a so single, shot, single shot, just conventional image. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So typically, if they want to digitize the slide, mm -hmm. they would do a Z scan mm -hmm. and find the sharpest focus and maybe stitch them digitally back later. Right, right. But at FPM, you don't need to do any of the Z scans. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so from the measured spatially varying aberration, you can kind of deduce you know, what the filter surface profile looks like uh, by just teasing out the defocus term. So, you, just, you see that the filter actually had a height variation of about 200 microns. Um, but regardless of their, posi their position in Z, we were able to resolve these images clearly. So on the left, you see before of, uh, the spatially varying aberration commutation. But on the right, after that commutation, you see the cells being clearly resolved. And in the end, these images have to be you know, usable for a microscopist. So they did a cell count using the images captured by the FPM and also captured by the standard microscopy. And they're able to show a nice correlation, which means uh, it is a very good uh, alternative to uh, using a conventional microscope. But also the count for the conventional microscope is based on single shot, right? Yes. Are you using that as the but gold they, standard? Computer? No, but then they have to use single shot, yeah. but it's a limited field of view, right? Mm -hmm. So in this picture, so this actually corresponds to just this region. So they actually have to translate so the slide. So the full count is no longer a single shot then? 
Full count is not single count. They have to count. scan. They have your scan mechanical. Right, but in FPM, you just need to scan the LEDs. Yeah. Or turn on different LEDs. Right. It'd be nice to compare the amount of time spent right. for either one, right? So right, right, right. You probably can show a huge enhancement in terms of the, like the, throughput? Know, the physician's time, yeah, the throughput. Right, right. So, right. What, what limits how fast the LEDs can be switched? Uh, basically, the, uh, the intensity of the LED. So the LEDs that we used here was um, some kind of a just display LEDs. So they weren't like super bright in intensity. So it did take about um, 10 minutes to capture like 225 images okay. yeah, in this particular setup. But by using high power laser, you can capture the same amount of images within one second. So it's just limited by the power. Okay, you can fill up your case space within one second. Oh yeah, because you can capture like 95 or 100 images within with a galvo and just mirrors I see. yeah so i'm not yeah i don't have it in my talk but yeah it's one, one of the work that i also did yeah so the work that i mean is it important that these images be collected in real time as well um fpm images can not be rec uh, collected in real time because not only do you have to capture you also have to but do the phase process. retrieval process yeah so that, that's what I was getting to. So it, it, whether you say it takes a second to acquire mm -hmm. the entire image or a minute, is that dwarfed by how long it takes to do the computation? Is that, pardon? Is that dwarfed by, so oh, you know, yeah. take a minute to a right. second if I'm right, right, processing right. for an hour? Right, okay. right. So processing time uh, takes about like five seconds okay. for each tile. But there are many tiles, so you have you do have to use a uh, graphics uh, processing unit to kind of paralyze that process. Um, but that wasn't the focus of my work. Yeah. For some applications, mm -hmm. the acquisition time is more critical, right, than post processing. If there's some dynamics you want to capture, you know, if you image a live cell, there's some mm -hmm. fast events you want to capture yeah. that you want to acquire them and post process. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Or like a slow down. Yeah. yeah. You can take about, talk about one example, right? With the eye, uh -huh. that one is fast. Yeah, so with the digital comp. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so I was able to demonstrate a high resolution wide field of view imaging without mechanical scanning. And also demonstrate that entire field of view can be sharply in focus regardless of their spatially varied operations. <coughs> but there are limitations to this method. So first of all, the sample needs to be thin. And that's limitation from the FPM algorithm itself because the whole pipeline was based on the fact that uh, the sample is there. And also, this aberration correction method cannot be applied to fluorescence imaging because uh, <coughs> FPM is a coherent imaging modality. So then, I asked the question, can we use FPM to actually correct for the fluorescence imaging? Because fluorescence imaging is widely used in, among biologists to study uh, uh, cell cellular dynamics. So this could be uh, more use, make FPM more useful. So that segues into the next part of my talk, which is the aberration corrected bright field and fluorescence imaging. So the difference between the fluorescence imaging and FPM imaging is that FPM is coherent while fluorescence is incoherent. So by that, I mean for coherent imaging, you have a plane wave or spatially coherent wave that's incident on the sample. And every point on the sample will have some uh, phase relationship with respect to each other. And uh, when it passes through the imaging system, you get a transfer function that is called a CTF, the coherent transfer function, that's shaped like uh, the aperture. And you sample, um, a low, uh, sample a small region of the, uh, the sample spe spatial spectrum. But in case of uh, incoherent imaging modality, no matter how you eliminate the samples, it excites the fluorophores in independently, um, and they do not have any phase relationship with each other. And its transfer the object, the, the imaging system's transfer function also is different. It's called uh, optical transfer function, and it looks like kind of a triangle uh, filter with a uh, band with <coughs> twice the bandwidth of uh, the CTF. So what made what enabled FPM to capture a high SPP image was that by tilting the illumination angle, you could sample different regions of the spatial spectrum of the sample um, that would otherwise be not be able to acquire. But in case of fluorescence, you cannot 
do that, uh, employ that trick. But there is a relationship between the CTF and the OTF, and it's just by simple means of autocorrelation. So OTF is um, autocorrelation of the CTF. In spatial domain, you can think of it as the point spread function of incoherent system. It is simply a, a magnitude square of the uh, coherent uh, point spread function. So we were able to acquire the CTF using FPM. So, so what is the physical reason for that? Physical reason for the it's relationship really between specific. CTF and OTF. So you can think about uh, a point in a, the sample space, and it'll map to a point square function in the imaging system, right? For a coherent system, uh, different points on the sample plane will add coherently with phase and amplitude. But for incoherent system, a point maps to just intensity pattern. So you're just convolving this intensity pattern with your sample, right? So just going from spatial domain to frequency domain, it's more obvious yeah. that it's the autocorrelation. So we were able to reconstruct the CTF uh, using FPM. So with this trick, we can reconstruct the aberration function of a fluorescence image, right? So this is the proposed, the setup that I proposed, where you have a typical uh, FPM uh, acquisition setup with the LED matrix providing coherent illuminations and a 4F system. And after you capture FPM images, you can use an excitation LED to excite the fluorophores in the fluorescent sample. And because it's captured under the same imaging condition with the same uh, optical setup and the same wavelength, you should be able to use the pupil function that you, you get from FPM to deconvolve the aberration out of the fluorescent image. So how do we do that deconvolution? So here's the mathematical model of a coherent image uh, formation. So I is a coherent, uh, sorry, fluorescence image formation. So I is a fluorescence image, which is a convolution of the intensity PSF uh, convolved with um, the, the fluorescence object. In the frequency domain, you can simply represent it as the, the transfer function, the OTF, times the object, spe spatial spectrum. And looking at this naive equation, you can, you can get, maybe you can just divide I by H to recover O. But that, does, that would not work because the OTF, unlike the CTF, can have multiple zeros within its bandpass. And in any realistic imaging system, your image has noise. So which means that when you try to, become, when you try to divide out these zero regions from your image spatial frequency spectrum, you're going to amplify noise. And the result that you get will be just junk. So a realistic uh, model of the image acquisition, uh, acquisition would be to add noise to each term. And instead of simply dividing by the OTF, you use a regularized um, deconvolution. So in this case, we use a Tikhonov regularization with a constant that we varied um, for the best visual result. So here. Just a comment then. Pardon? Just a comment. We're becoming beholden to mathematicians where we call this. This is a Wiener filter. Oh, uh, right, so, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, for a Wiener field, her K shouldn't be a constant either. K should be frequency dependent. That's yeah, right, yeah, it's yeah, actually, you shouldn't have, have a noise frequency. Yeah. yeah. So this is like a Wiener with a small point. Wiener with some approximation. It's a yeah. 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 <laughs> Good catch. Um, so you have uh, this pipeline where, so in this case, I have a, bunch of microbead samples, some are fluorescent, some are non-fluorescent. You can do FPM to recover pupil function and intensity image, and then you use the, the Tikhonov or the you know, approximated Wiener deconvolution to recover the aberration free image of the microbeads, right? So you see from the line plot that you can resolve these beads much more clearly after deconvolution. And uh, overlaying this fluorescence image with the bright field image, you actually gain more information from the single image. You notice that this big bead must not have any fluorescence, while these small beads should be fluorescent. So that can be very useful in uh, biological uh, imaging scenarios. So and this is an example that we've, uh, we've done uh, by imaging uh, HeLa cells. So HeLa cells were both stained for intensity and also fluorescence. So here on the left side, you see the FPM reconstructed 
you know, high SPP image of these neural cells, along with uh, spatially varying aberrations. And on the right, you see the fluorescence image of the HeLa cells. But for different regions of the field of view, you see a, a varied performance because of the spatially varying aberration. So using these pupil functions and the deconvolution, you can observe sharp uh, images throughout the field of view. And overlaying these, uh, the bright field image from the FPM and fluorescence image, uh, you can get uh, multimodal information. So as an example here, in the fluorescence channel, you see these two nuclei here, but in the bright field, overlay with the bright field image, you see the clear delineation by the cell membranes, indicating these are two independent cells. While here, you do see you know, two cell nuclei, um, but here in the bright field image, you don't see the uh, cell membrane separating these nuclei, which means they're still uh, in the same cell body. <coughs> So these are some key findings. So advantages of this method is that you can now <coughs> remove aberration from both the bright field and the fluorescence images. And the multimodal imaging for biological specimens could shed new, more light into the information of the sample. But it still has limitations, which is you do still need the spatially coherent field for illuminating the sample, right? Even though you just want to capture fluorescence, you need this LED matrix to first reconstruct the FPN image and then use that pupil function to get rid of the fluorescence aberration. And also this will, which means this will not work for many of the imaging scenarios. For example, if you want to image a distant object with like a camera, you cannot provide like a spatially illuminate, uh, coherent illumination so far away. Or imaging the retina of the eye where you know, you're trying to look at the retina through this, uh, this poor lens of your eye. Uh, but it's, so it's impossible to provide a spatially coherent field on the retina to do the FPM process. Question, um, yeah. do you have to match the LED wavelengths with your fluorescent light? Yes, yeah. So I kind of you know, breezed through that, but um, in the optical setup, I make sure that I have a filter, both for FPM acquisition process and the, the fluorescence wavelength is matched to the basically the illumination of the yeah. So that means you have to select the right dye, or exactly. Or, okay. Yeah. So but I would rather pick my device according to the dye instead of. Mm -hmm. You can't tell people say I can only image this dye, right? Uh, so, but but your LED has a fixed RGB. wavelength, is it, or you have RGB, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So is it possible for you to match <laughs> that with the dye instead? Oh uh, yeah, sure. Right. Yeah, if you know the color of the dye, then mm -hmm. you would capture FPN images with the corresponding emission wavelength. Right. You can also use a white light LED, right? right exactly. And then you just change that filter. You, you know, can filter change the color time, time, yeah. Right, because then uh, they, they, it will permit both of those uh, right. sources to be restricted to the same wavelength band. Right, right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there are other people doing um, aberration correction for fluorescence. Uh -huh. So how, how does your method compare to what uh, the other group is doing? So other fluorescence decomposition method um, so one thing that just comes to my head is kind of a deconvolution in a Z. So if your fluorescence is kind of buried in a sample um, and it's not correctly focused, they kind of um, estimate the imaging system's TSF and they perform deconvolution and pick the one that looks the best. Mm -hmm. So it's based on guesswork, mm -hmm. right? But in this case, the FPM is pr able to provide you know, what it should be from the gradient descent algorithm and we just use that. So we're not using any other metric to kind of guess the aberration. And also, in that case, um, I think it assumes like a perfect PSF with defocus aberration. So it cannot really account for spatially varying aberration, which can have you know, coma, astigmatism, other aberrations like that. So this is more robust than that. Okay, so I asked this question. <laughs> Can we remove the spatially coherent illumination requirement to get rid of the aberration? So that segues into the final segment of my work. It's aberration correction in a general optical system. So how do we kind of retrieve the aberration um, without you know, spatially coherent illumination? So this is kind of a, the thought process behind it. So you can imagine a 4F system, and you have a dot 
uh, on the left, and let's call that the full point square function. And in the Fourier plane, we place a small aperture so that what comes out of it is a limited uh, beam. And it focuses to a point after this lens, and it's the point square function, but bigger, because your aperture is much smaller. So let's call that limited PSF. And for a perfect imaging system, no matter where you block the aperture, you will always get this limited PSF centered in that area. But let's say that the lens has aberration, right? So instead of a plane wave, you'll have this uh, phase modulated uh, wavefront that's coming out. And if you, in this case, if you segment this middle section, you'll have kind of a tilted wave coming out that will focus to a shifted point in uh, image space. And here, it will focus to a uh, dot, uh, to, to a location there, and and so. So which means that you know these dots shifting in location encodes some information about the the wavefront aberration, right? In the realistic imaging scenario, this translates to imaging a target with this limited aperture system. So you'll get like low resolution image, but that's shifting. Uh, according to the local waves, uh, local um, wavefront, and from this information, you can extract this limited PSF from these uh, shifting images. And from that information, it turns out you can use the phase retrieval algorithm to reconstruct what that aberration function should look like. So after multiple iteration, so this is the reconstructed pupil function. So after you have that, we use the same deconvolution procedure to get rid of the aberration in the aberrated image. But you know, naive deconvolution in this way would not give you a good result because of the same reason that I mentioned before. You have multiple zeros in the OTF, right? Which means that in regions where the OTF goes to zero, the deconvolution result will not be great. So it corresponds to this region, that region, that region. So how do we account for that? You know, how do we get rid of these zero regions? So I did some literature uh, research and found this paper by Chang In Zhou from Columbia in 2009, where he was able to put a coded aperture in the aperture plane to basically remove the zero regions in the uh, OTF. So he shows a comparison between the circular aperture and coded aperture. So deconvolution result with circular aperture is poorer than if you were to put a coded aperture uh, in your um, Fourier domain. So we use that same aperture. So this deconvolution is the one you use the regularization with. It wasn't the naive inversion. Yeah, it's still with uh, um, yeah regularized. Yeah. Are you familiar with all these coded aperture stuff? I haven't heard no. <clears throat> so, if you were to put a coded aperture on top of the pupil function, and yeah, cast what it's doing is you're trying to control the yeah. pupil function, right? So exactly. So, literally, just putting a mask on the pupil. Then you get so let's convert that into OTF. You notice that the zero regions in the OTF are kind of shifted around by placing this coded aperture. And I also try to rotate this in, in many orientation to shift it around. So you compare the OTF of a, a circular aperture only with uh, OTF of combined apertures. You notice the zero regions are removed or reduced so that the deconvolution result is much clearer at the end of the day. So uh, after this uh, simulation validation, we moved on to experimentally demonstrating this method. So in the transmission geometry, you have a sample that you want to image, and this is your kind of crude lens that you can buy from Amazon. Um, and uh, we image the pupil of this to the SLM, and so that we modulate which part of the aperture goes through, and we capture uh, goes through to be captured by the uh, camera. And the illumination is provided by incoherent light source, so it doesn't have any spatial coherence. So using a Siemens target as a demonstration, 
um, we were able to, so the circular region corresponds to what a diffraction limited system should be able to resolve. And we noticed that before uh, the correction, we cannot resolve these spokes pattern clearly, but after the deconvolution, we can resolve the spokes pattern at the resolution that you would expect to see at a diffraction limited setting. And uh, counting for spatially varying aberration, we had a sample consisting of US Air Force target uh, uh, spread across the field of view. And uh, it, after the decommission procedure, we were able to resolve a diffraction limited performance across the field of view. So which one is your construction? So here on the, the left small squares are before aberration compensation. And the right small squares are after average compensation. So what is the difference between B, C, and D? B, C, and D. So B is this region. Oh, I see. It's a C region. is that region. D is that region. Yeah. So I'm just trying to demonstrate that the spatially varying aberration we can com com compensate for. And you do see the aberration in these regions are different, indicated by the pupil function, which look different. So far, emotionally, uh, you get that. Like, if you look in the imaging system, Aberrations at different locations in the field of view is going to be different. Yeah. But how different? If you, if you had applied the same correction to all of them, what would you get? Yep, you can see that people function here showing up. Yeah, so they, they look different, but you yeah. can't tell how, how <coughs> different. How different? How different? different? Yeah. If you apply the same people function, what happens <coughs> to all of them? Oh, if you apply the. Okay, so I noticed that for these two images, because they're kind of similar, you were still able to resolve a, a good image. But for this one, it has like kind of astigmatism to it, right? So using this pupil to deconvolve this image, you get you still get some smearing residue. So, so it the, helps. It does help a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By accounting for different aberrations. But no, sorry. I mean, uh, it, even if you use the one from B on D, you would still have an improvement over the uh, uncorrected one. But yeah, because um, in this case, I had I kind of added more aberration by defocusing the sample. So they're all gonna share some kind of defocus term. I see. So I can get rid of that, but that, that was only for that system. Yeah. You know, you can imagine other maybe higher NA objective lens would, which have, has, more severe, would have more severe independent aberration terms. Yeah. <clears throat> so after validating it on this um, resolution target, I wanted to move on to imaging the retina of the eye. Uh, so before that, um, I had to make some changes to the imaging system. So instead of a transmission geometry, I had to provide illumination through the lens, right? So it's an incoherent source, uh, providing illumination with the beam splitter. And also had to make sure that this pupil is aligned to the SLM by adding a pupil alignment camera. And on top of that, I needed another arm for a motion reference camera, which is, uh, which is there to basically account for the motion of the in vivo eye. So before moving on to in vivo target, uh, I acquired a, a phantom eye and embedded a US Air Force target at the back and tried to image with my system. So this is prior to correcting for the aberration. You notice that the aberration is severe uh, because the lens in that model is not great. Applying the aberration correction method, you can resolve the features uh, much more clearly, and uh, the features actually correspond to uh, correspond to the range that you should be able to recover, um, as, uh, given the diffraction limited condition. <clears throat> and looking at different regions of the uh, resolution target, uh, I can re recover sharp images for different regions, and they do have spatially varying aberrations, as indicated by these different pupils. Okay, so then I had to make this setup uh, usable for in vivo imaging. So I had to make sure that all this setup is uh, transportable on a cart because the monkeys, the, the animal model that we used, were, uh, were housed in a BBB facility. So I had to bring the system over there um, every morning, every week. <laughs> uh, and this, these are some photos from the imaging session, one of the imaging sessions. Um, so there are many complications that arose because it's in vivo imaging. For example, the anesthesia could only last for one hour for the safety of the animal. And also the cornea dried really fast, uh, which meant that I had, we had to purchase a custom gas permeable lens 
uh, to place on the, the monkey's eye to prevent the cornea from drying. And also, the most importantly, the, the amount of light that we can deliver to the retina was severely constricted uh, because we did, we did not want to hurt the animal. So we had to, so which means that we had very low uh, signal to noise ratio in our capture images. So the only way to kind of increase the SNR was to capture multiple frames and average them together. So this is, um, but when you capture multiple images, the animal's eye, you know, is still <coughs> kind of drifting and moving about. So we have to make sure that these images are first corrected for motion, register for motion. So we have to first register these capture images for motion. And these are about uh, 2,000 images. Register them for motion. And then sum them up to increase the SNR. So this is what you would typically get from one frame. But after averaging about 200 frames, you're able to increase the SNR. Um, and that's critical for our, my method because it works by deconvolution. And deconvolution is a very noisy sensitive uh, method. So using the, the method, uh, I can recover the pupil function and use the convolution to retrieve uh, the underlying resolution, uh, the high resolution image of the retina. And you can see the, the dots here, they correspond to the photoreceptors, which should be between two to eight microns. And here in the photo, they correspond to about five microns. So we think that this is not just artifact of uh, the convolution, but they are real features. But the uh, yeah, but the, but the quality of, of it was not too great because we had to account for the motion. Uh, so basically, it wasn't the most ideal uh, imaging uh, showcase for our setup. Um, but we plan to do some future work on that, uh, that that may be more applicable. So advantages of this method is that aberration compensation can be done without any of the spatial coherence uh, requirement on elimination. And it's much simpler than the hardware-based aberration correction. So for imaging the eyes, uh, people <coughs> typically use adaptive optics, which consists of a dynamic wavefront corrector and a wavefront measurement device. But this one, we only need an SLM and uh, a lot of post-processing to compensate for the aberration uh, in, on the computer. And this is also applicable to a broad <coughs> range of imaging scenarios. So not only imaging uh, biological samples, but you know, in, in general photography, the same principles should apply. And this can also work for uh, wider uh, fluorescence imaging uh, applications. Uh, so one major limitation, as I mentioned, is longer acquisition time um, and you, uh, because you need more data set. And you also need uh, a lot more photon budget in order for the deconvolution to work uh, in your favor. So future work, uh, we want to apply this to imaging fluorescence samples on this rough surface. So that way, this, uh, the sample is static. We can capture uh, many frames, as many frames as possible. And uh, this kind of imaging is challenging for a conventional uh, imaging method. And also, we plan to apply this in a light sheet microscopy, uh, where we can use this method to remove the sample-induced aberration in the light sheet imaging process, uh, capturing process. Yeah. So that, that concludes uh, my last work. And on the prospect of computationally addressing the lens limitation, I want to end with the following quote from Albert Einstein, where he said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So uh, for a long time, uh, lens makers, lens designers, added more lens to account for the aberrations from lens. So maybe using a computational method to solve the lens's aberration uh, will give you um, much better results and might be the future for imaging in the future. So I'm very excited about the prospect of computational imaging, and I look forward to what the juniors in the lab come up with in the near future and and on. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, Acknowledgement. So I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, Professor Chang Wei-yang, uh, for being a great mentor and motivating me. And the FPM team over the years, uh, Xiao Zhe, O, Roar Korsmeyer, Jin Ho Kim, Kang Wen Lu, and Daniel Martin. And also other seniors in the lab, uh, uh, and also uh, seniors and colleagues in the lab, Musak Jiang, Edward Haojang, Jo Haowen Ron, and Joshua Brick, and the rest of the bioelectronics lab for uh, the great uh, working environment and support, and our lab manager, uh, Anne Sullivan, for streaming, streamlining uh, the, P the whole PhD experience, and uh, the tennis buddies that I always play tennis with three times a week sometimes. 
and my friends and family, and the funding agencies, uh, NIH and Caltech. So thank you very much. So questions from the audience, I guess? Yeah. From the, Any questions from the audience? <coughs> Well, if not, uh, we'll, we'll excuse the audience and then, uh, because we need to interrogate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if uh, the audience will find out, uh, stepping up.